Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see you today. My name is Dustin Cormier, and this is How to Rock Astrology. I'm very, very happy and excited to have a guest on my show today by the name of Simon Vorster. Simon Vorster is with Raising Vibrations, raising-vibrations.com. Uh, you can also find him on his own YouTube channel. He's been doing great work with, I believe it's your partner, Jen. Is that correct, Simon? That's right. Wonderful. So Jen and Simon have been doing work for a long time, talking about uh, many Western astrology symbols. And from what I've been perceiving, uh, you have a lot of intuitive information coming through you that seems to even go sometimes beyond what we've given in many cultural formulas of astrology. You've gotten into human design and you have a lot of intuitions that I deeply respect. Um, so as an astrologer and as a fellow person interested in the crazy wild dynamics of human consciousness, thank you so much for being on my show. I yeah, appreciate it, man. Looking forward to this conversation as well. Uh, Excellent. Always love to, to hold the space. Well, I really appreciate it, Simon. So today, Simon, uh, I've brought you on my channel. I've got a little bit of a questionnaire to talk about. The main theme of today's channel, uh, of today's discussion, uh, I've centered it to be around the outer planets of astrology. As my audience knows, I am a tropical Vedic astrologer. Mm -hmm. And Vedic astrology is never, because it is a system that is mostly based on the ancient idea of the rulership of the planets, um, in a time when telescopes weren't invented, Vedic astrology really bases it, most of its dynamics on the first seven, well, the first, the seven planets plus yeah. the two nodes that makes the numerology of nine. There's a big focus on this in Vedic astrology and many people are saying there's a big, there's a wide debate going on in the Vedic world which is considering that maybe it's possible that the reason the outer planets were not considered in ancient Sanskrit and ancient Vedic texts, A, is because how I think about it, astrology is very much a practical thing that was handed down through the practice of lay astrologers. Now, it's possible most stuff in Vedic astrology comes from the scriptures written down by rishis. Rishis yeah. were people long ago who lived and were transmitting, uh, you know, they, they had incredible clear consciousness. They had, um, there's a word for it, clarity of a sort. Okay. I can't think of it in my brain, but uh, they at the time could see that earth is in an, a galaxy in a galaxy that's revolving around the Milky Way. They could see the whole thing. These insights got passed down and it was passed down orally at a time when there was no writing. So most of the mantras, most of the scriptures were passed down in this way and then practiced. Unfortunately, the astrologers of the time could not practice with the outer planets. Right. So it's possible that there's not much scripture regarding the outer planets because there was nothing for them to base on a, a practical astrological symbolism through or a, a practice through. Now, in the modern day, many of my, the people in my audience are well steeped and well versed in the Vedic idea of the, again, the first seven planets and the two nodes. Sure. My, on my channel, I've been interested in bringing together these cultural traditions so that the Vedic people can see the usefulness and purposefulness and reality of the outer planets and their transformational energies. As well, those in my Western audience uh, can see how I pull a Vedic consciousness yeah. into these things. Right. So I always make the intros nice and long <laughs> without okay. further ado. Uh, so Simon, I'm, I'm glad for you to be here to talk with me about the outer planets. Mm -hmm. Now I've given you a little questionnaire. Uh, the first few questions I thought I'd ask, uh, I usually intend for something like a video like this to get into the practical stuff, 
Before we do, you and I asked you a question about what we would call the mythos and archetypes. Uh, sure. You know, before we started, we were chatting, Simon, and uh, we mentioned that, you know, there's only so much literature on the outer planets, probably for the same reason that I just mentioned. Even in the Hellenistic tradition, telescopes that could readily perceive the outer planets didn't exist until the, the 1900s, I believe, yeah. the late 1900s. So there, there, I know that the Greeks have talked about in their mythology, uh, the outer planets, and that's very intriguing to me. Now, I'm wondering if you have any clues as to the cultural inf- unfoldment and symbols that are used to describe these outer planets. Do, do we have anything in terms of scripture that we can point to, to give us a grounding on what they mean? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know uh, if we're thinking about Uranus, uh, Neptune, and Pluto, uh, one question I just want to fire back at you quickly is, yeah. uh, could, we, could we bring it even to today's time where those archetypes and the language that's around how Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus is, is described. So kind of going to something that's very mythos and then kind of looking at something that's, you know, today. That we can relate to in today's yeah. time. Because we, yeah. you know, the symbols, the energy is in our consciousness. So uh-huh. we're bound to reflect them in our cultural symbols. It's Absolutely. a very interesting thing to think about. So if you have any yeah. thoughts in regard to that, I would love for you to add them sure. into the mix. Absolutely. So um, the story... My, my favorite story to tell when connecting archetypically with somebody doing an astrology conversation, if they're more prone towards seeing reality in an abstract way, mm. right? So more of a Sagittarius uh, way of looking at things is Pisces mm. is Neptune. So Neptune is, is uh, this famous story. It's the story of Ariadne. Okay. So if you, if you've seen the film inception, Okay. You'll, not- mm-hmm. you'll notice that um, there is a character that helps one of the main characters build dreams. Neptune is very much about the landscape of dreams, right? Things that we can, we experience through impression and yet we can't really grab. We can't, we can't grab a dream, right? You can't hold onto it physically. And so just in that, you already can start to understand the nature of Neptune in its, in its nature. It's, it's, a, it's an archetype it's a story it's a it reflects itself in our lives as experiences of something that we can have deep impressions from we can hold within our our sense of reality but we can't we can't put our finger on it it's like it, we can't touch it because the moment we touch it we influence it with our condition mm. right so the story of ariadne and um she she has this relationship so the minotaur Right, so in Greek uh, Greek mythology, there's this minotaur that lives in the in the maze, and so Ariadne forms a relationship with a character I cannot remember completely, mm. uh, but for, just for the sake of the way that this is, gets described, no worries. Um, she 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 gets um, her her dad puts her on an island in 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 one of the Greek islands, like uh, Crete or something. Mm-hmm. You can go and check this this story out. And uh, she needs to escape, but she can't because the island is completely sort of water, right? Surrounded by water. And so this, this main character finds himself on this island and she uh, says that she wants to escape. And he says, yeah, that's fine. I can help you escape. Uh, but one of the things that I need to do first is I need to kill this minotaur as a way of my own freedom. To, to get rid of my own freedom right off this island mm. so, so what she does is she forms a relationship with this person but it's the idea of trust mm. okay she has to she says wait here yeah, let me go and kill this this minotaur so i can bring back his head and then we can escape so we can we can i'll i'll take you with me does that make sense yeah so she she kind of finds this 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 is this first impression of trust Right. right, where we surrender to our, our faith or our, our experience of life towards another person. Right? And I see that almost as being uh, there's a metaphor of a divine romance of yes. the mysterious Neptunian spiritual tones willing to uh-huh. kill the Minotaur, which I'm putting a bestial, earthly yeah. ego uh-huh. metaphor on. Cool, uh-huh. delicious, got it, got dude. It. That's great. 
Exactly. Um, and it's, you know, there's, there's a masculine way of describing this story and there's a feminine way of describing the story. And, and this is kind of a little bit more on the feminine side in the sense that um, it's more about relations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you're right. Like, I like what you've done there because that's exactly what this, this, the, the mythos is supposed to invoke within us, mm -hmm. is to invoke the, the way that we relate to these archetypes because archetypes themselves are principles of reality that are embedded or arise out of creation. Mm. So it, it, think of it as like an archetype is a riverbed or the riverbed, should I say, is creation itself. And then the archetype is the water that flows through it. Nice. But the riverbed conditions the archetype. The groove. Okay? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's why we can have Plutonian archetypes and Neptunian archetypes in Greek mythology. And then in the day's age that we live in right now, we can have the same principles of life, but they're shaped differently. Mm. Something beautiful about the nature of archetypes is that, that they are deeply cultural bound. And yet at the same time, hold a, a, a static principle of the same theme. Right. We see the water as a cultural symbol, but the water yes. is coming from the uh -huh. energy. Exactly, 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 exactly. <laughs> Very right. cool, Simon. I love that mythos of Neptune in particular is beautiful. Uh, it reminds me of the Western occult symbol of what's called the purple, the, the divine prince in the Aleister Crowley sense. Yes. Uh, he has this mythos of a dark prince that the, the feminine receptive dimension of the ego falls in love with the spirit of the dark prince of kundalini okay. and there's a divine romance there you know yes. the romance of the dark prince of i'm equating this to neptune uh, -huh. uh the romance of this dark prince is that much more satisfying and loving in the heart of the soul than the minotaur yes <laughs> the earthly reality <laughs> And, and what's, what's really poetic about this, particularly Neptune where it's poetic, right? Mm, yeah. Is that, is that romance is very much associated with Neptune. Mm, okay? mm -hmm. Because you can have a romantic perception on something. And so you're overlaying your own projection of what it is that you see onto the physical world, Saturn. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so Neptune is very much in, in an archetypical sense, if you see it in a person's chart, Practically speaking, mm. where you see Neptune in your charts, that's where you're going to project the ultimate meaning. And so what Ariadne does here is, is that she projects the ultimate meaning of being saved by her savior. And he's going to go down and show his masculinity by killing this thing. And then he's going to rest. She's going to be rescued. And it's this divine kind of ultimate. I need to, to, uh, I found love as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And being rescued by the masculine. And so he goes down, he kills her, he kills the, the Minotaur and he comes back and he actually leaves the land without her. And this is a pivotal point of Neptune mm. is that he leaves the land without her. And of course, uh, this invokes deep betrayal. Oh, that's part of this archetype. Yes. Mm. So Neptune in your astrology chart is a reflection of the deepest betrayal that can exist. Hmm. as human beings right so i'm why almost is that the case very interesting i see like you know adam and eve-ish kind of yes original exactly. sin vibes going on here yes exactly so neptune you know correlates to where the deepest betrayal in your own psychic experience and your own personal journey exists and the reason why this is the case is because human beings in order to to find meaning in their suffering, Neptune suffering, mm. they project an ultimate meaning into the experience. And then as we go through life, we have cycles of disillusionment. And one of the most prolific disillusionments that took place in a Pluto and Virgo generation, when Pluto was transiting Virgo, and I think it was 1960 to 1972, mm -hmm. was that they had Neptune in Scorpio. Mm. And if you look at that time, and you talk to any person that's born between that phase, you can touch that Neptunian wound because to them, their story has been the search for the divine, the search for God. Mm. And their idea is to try and kind of like merge with God, to merge with the ultimate meaning. And yet they've been struck down by illnesses or diseases or experiences that have rendered them 
questioning their relationship to their ego sense of God, mm. as opposed to the deeper inquiry as to what the sickness really represents or the illness represents or the disability represents or the chaos. That the, really Virgo in, the Virgo in elements of Pluto in Virgo. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Hmm. So, and so, so I want to kind of ground it a little bit more and say that human beings, it is true to say that human beings all sit in a womb for nine months primarily. And so we are connected through the umbilical cord to the divine and feminine, which is the mother, right? So we're connected to that source. But the moment we emerge into the world, the umbilical cord gets cut. And this is a symbolic representation of Neptune because it is our separation from the source that leads us to returning back to it. To and knowing that we've been in its embrace and exactly. the, thirst, the thirst to get back to it. Right, exactly. And so there's this beautiful idea of that this, the, the true spirituality is the removal of all of our illusions so that we can actually see that we're not separate. Hmm. So we've been right. attached to that divine mother umbilical cord all along. It's our sense of betrayal, almost our projection of wanting the feeling of betrayal in a weird, the weird way the ego works. Uh huh that causes this archetype to exist. It makes it that much more delicious when yes. we feel our connection to that umbilical cord. Yes. Yes. It's the yes. classic, uh, you know, Neptune is often considered to be, you know, it's like suffering first. Yes. Uh, there's uh, the promise of suffering. And once we can deal with that reality and let go of the feeling of that inherent sense of betrayal, that we come into the realization that we've been connected to that divine mother all this time and it's a really 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 intense thing to experience because when you're put in the situation of where your faith of reality is questioned you really understand this principle alive within you because there are many times where a, a mother has lost a child and so how can life be so mean how can mm. life be so horrible to me right who would want to lose a child or we can think of something as uh, in today's pandemic, right? Um, many people have been separated from people Each that other. have died and they haven't mm -hmm. had that closure or that they've like the rules have been put in place. And so there's a lot of kind of displaced anger mm -hmm. towards institutions and structures who have had to enforce these regulations for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so people have, have lost their grandparent and through whatever, right? And they couldn't go and visit them in the hospital. And so there's yeah. this, this people carry with them the betrayal of the civilization or the betrayal of the government or the betrayal of life with them. And that's why it's the ultimate betrayal because it's like, it hits us on such a deep level that we mm -hmm. can't actually, the grief that we need to process through deepens our, our relationship to our own spirituality. It asks us to find meaning. Certainly, right? certainly. Very interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's a really profound thing, and that's what Neptune does. It points to where the spirit is trying mm. to awaken itself within you through experiences that shatter the illusions of the ego's preferences or right. dreams. It's very interesting to me. Uh, one of the reasons that, you know, this is a great primer on the archetypes of Neptune. <laughs> And, you know, I really see, again, there's a, the romance is a very uh -huh. interesting word for me uh, when, with regards to Neptune. Um, often when we deal with, are you aware, um, have you ever heard of the word Kundalini? Yes. A, yeah. Uh -huh. So of course, that's a very thrown around uh, expression these days. Sure. Uh, Kundalini typically reflects the same sort of romance where the spinal centers default mode on planet earth because gravity is pulling us down is to express apana uh to express downward outside of oneself direction towards one's consciousness mm -hmm. uh this is almost like once you've been birthed from the womb and you cut the umbilical cord you're running everywhere except where you came from to try and make the connection to that umbilical cord again uh the divine romance of Neptune kind of suggests in a way is that there are those people, I suppose, whose Neptunian vessel is permeating 
or opening in their consciousness more and more over time, probably through enough suffering of having gone outside the womb for so long, you know, after incarnation, after incarnation, some people have gone through enough of this suffering of this betrayal to start to sense and even distrust the sense of betrayal where there might be something deeper. There might be something that we more intrinsically are. Uh, that is to say that in Kundalini, once you've had enough and you've been sick of the external expression of your energy, once you start turning it inward, then there becomes a funny, again, in Alistair Crowleyan terms, he calls Shiva and the Kundalini part of the ego is sort of like a, a whore, a harlot. Yeah. Because yeah. it keeps cheating on the earth ego with the spirit, and it keeps on cheating this on the spirit ego with the earth, yeah. and it keeps yeah. going back and forth. And I'm so one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is because Neptune transits and Neptunian phenomenon in happening to a person is typically associated with deep existential pain deep yes. existential betrayal. And so far as I've heard from Carl Jung, Carl Jung describes a, a dissolution uh, where, you know, those of us on planet earth, in order to survive, you've got to have biologically productive fortification circuits, real touristy, you know, grounded earth stuff. And if our ego is too attached to the earth, then you can't give it to the romance of the Neptunian mm -hmm. desire to let go of it all. Because once you're in your mother's womb, you're good. You don't yeah, got to worry exactly. about nothing. You don't, <laughs> you don't need to worry about anything. But if you are a busy, worldly business person, and you decide to take a trip into your mother's womb, that could actually be a frustrating thing. Right. Or, you know, our experience on Earth is that we are supposed to be working on these things that have kept us surviving. Now divine mother myth visits us and says, you actually, if you don't do all that, you might survive, although you'll suffer. Sure. And this is part of the, you know, I guess the reason I'm bringing all this up is because I'm trying to speak to the archetype of Neptune as being painful, where in order to take, to make the most out of a Neptunian transit, a Neptunian progression, or anything that's happening related to Neptune, that we have to be willing to surrender and sacrifice our ego. And all, you know, even to be in the world and managing, having your kids, you know, I believe it's a two way thing where sometimes the kids are all crying and you have to meditate and let go of the experience of this happening. And kind of let it figure itself out. Don't be too attached to putting your hand into your the thing and, and making it all work properly. On yes. the other hand, there's times where you want to let go and let the kids do their own damn thing, but you have to wake up and yeah. make sure that they are, they're fed, make sure that Johnny isn't pulling Timmy's nose and all these things. And you have to pay attention. So this two way dynamic of wanting to be completely withdrawn uh -huh. and wanting to be the furthest thing from being withdrawn. Yes. This is part of the divine romance of Neptune. And I guess in order to get in tune with it, you have to start playing between these two directions of your consciousness, I would say, because that really reflects on Kundalini consciousness. Well, you know, just to kind of amplify what you said there, that was, that was brilliant, by the way. Like, Thank you. Seriously, I, I really enjoyed your description of it because you you did that you played between the abstract and where that exists in the physical world in terms of interacting with children because they are very much a neptunian mm. experience um and and so uh, another dimension of neptune that i want to bring in here which you touched on was that when you experience a neptunian transit mm. okay another way to see it in a more sort of 21st century way is that it it is a reflection of where the spirit is so one of the ways to to experience neptune is it fades things okay it's it's an archetype that's showing you where in your life things had meaning and where it will fade 
Mm. Okay. Mm. And so as you go around the carousel that is your life, you will have an emotional connection to a sense of meaning towards something. And mm. then say 20 years later, you would have watched that meaning fade through experiences of disillusionment or X, Y, Z. And so you have this, this, this small little town, it's thriving. You know, there's, there's a few shops that are kind of present over there. Each shop is fulfilling the need of the community, right? And this is thriving. And then you take a Uranian experience where you take out, you go out of time and you accelerate yourself, say 50 years into the future. And you look back at that city and it's desolate. Right. There's nobody there. And so we're talking about the spirit of time. There's, we're talking about the essence of existence, the, the meaning of things and what uh, attracts us to, find, to seeing the romanticness of that community thriving. And then like Chernobyl, for instance, Chernobyl right. is a perfect example of a Neptunian Plutonian experience. In fact, it's actually an outer planetary experience uh, beautifully because you have this little town for those of you that don't know what Chernobyl mm -hmm. is, it's a nuclear um, power plant in, in Ukraine that's, that had uh, an explosion. Mm -hmm. And there was a town that was called Pripyat. And you could see Neptune there because the town had meaning. There were people there. There were people were thriving. There were mothers and, and families, etc. Now, when you go back to it, it's just overgrown because people don't live there anymore because there's an essence of of needing to yeah you can't live there anymore radioactive right you mean like overgrown with plants overgrown with plants yeah, yeah, the, yeah. You, you can see the paints not on the wall anymore right. but cool. we we used to be there so you see that that essence of of that there was something there meaning. but when you connect to it exactly it had meaning but now mm -hmm. it's faded and so if you translate that onto your own life you can see that if you look at say like with me, I have Neptune and Sagittarius. Okay. Mm. So I was raised and born in South Africa. That's the, that's the culture I live within, but I don't live there anymore. I live in Sweden. Right. And so, you know, within my state of consciousness, the, the cultural references, the, the ways that uh, South Africa would, um, its traditions, they are not part of me in the same way that they were say 20 years ago mm. because they have faded. Right. And so that Neptune and Sag reflects where somebody, the soul is fading. Mm. It's no longer the meaning in it is, is there. And so again, Neptune transits and take 14 years through a sign. Mm. The reason as to why they also are not probably in such a sense seen in astrology that would look at the first, say, nine states of consciousness, the sun nodes, and then up to mm -hmm. Saturn mm -hmm. is because these archetypes, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, they move so slowly that we're talking about the collective consciousness here. We're not talking about the individuated sense of self, right? So here's me, here's who I am. And then I'm interacting with the globe. I'm interacting with the shared experience of the pandemic or the shared experience of et cetera. Right. right. And these generational so, pockets are things that our inner planets are constantly in conversation with, with those from different generations and yes, even yes. just from transiting yes. planets. Exactly. So that's how you can see the clockwork of say somebody that interacts with a social media, like TikTok, for instance, and that's like, you know, 15 year old having cultural references saying, oh, you, you know, you do the dance and TikTok, but it's somebody that's like post World War II generation. That's like, what's the meaning in it? Why would, mm -hmm. why would you do those things? There's no reference. And so that is how those archetypes work. They, they, they shape the landscape of our generations and they are what actually influences the generations mm -hmm. in the way that we, we, we pick up on different things. For sure. That's a great, I always love that you're bringing it into a present day metaphor uh, it's mm -hmm. interesting that there's certainly a conversation going on between one generation who's doing the TikTok thing. Uh -huh. I see it all the time. As a 30-year-old person, I'm really <laughs> seeing both sides of so many conversations where the old folks are just like, I can't relate to us at all. And I relate a lot with older generations. I got Saturn and sure. Aquarius, and I get a okay. lot out of the older folks around me. There are times uh -huh. when I can see their wisdom. And this, this, this TikTok stuff is so silly and so dumb. 
But if I spend an, maybe it's you and I mentioned that I'm a reflector in human design and I'm picking up on this because uh-huh. there's times when I hang out with the young people and, you know, the baby boomers, they just don't get it, <laughs> you know, and I, uh, exactly. I really feed between both. So uh-huh. uh, that's very interesting to me. Now, uh, I think it's interesting. Really the conversation that you've put up here between Uranus and Neptune is intriguing to me with this metaphor. The Chernobyl thing is, is brilliant the way you've described it. Uh, I'm almost inclined to put it in a way in the sense that, you know, the one romance that hurt the most is, you know, sometimes when you have a romance, when you're young with a person and, you know, some, sometimes it can be very fleeting. Um, All of the, romances that we have all have different levels of meaning for us uh when you consider uranus as the speed of time it makes it almost makes the meaning found in neptune to be amplified by the preciousness of time it's like uranus makes the nep the destructiveness how shall i say it the death is what makes life precious. And yes. the Uranian, you know, the Uranian threat of transformation is what makes the eternal soul love of Neptune, the ideal, I should say, of Neptune, yes. that much more precious. I'm almost starting to feel that Neptune is very idealistic in a sense. It's an ideal that we hope can find expression in reality. Uh, and Uranus puts the fire under our experience of the ideal. Uh huh. And Pluto, to me, I'm interested in Pluto as being a necessary neurogenetic dimension of the groove of the river, in the sense oh, that. Love it. Thank you. I appreciate that. So Neptune is this ideal. Pluto always instigates. Uh, I typically find in our youth, we got no control over what Pluto is doing. And you come to be about 30 years old. Usually people go through their Saturn return. Neptune, I think, is always operating. They all Uh always are. But sometime through the midway of your life, you've been dealing with the romance of Neptune all this time. Uranus has changed things around as it does. Pluto is this sense that I can't go back and change how little I could, ex- I, I could, wanted to, ex- what am I trying to say? Pluto is the fact that you can't go back in time and change the fact that you didn't act on the Neptunian love. It's a guilt in a way, Pluto. It's wow. a, an okay. obsessive reality that karmically, as I understand it, will push us to do things that don't reflect the Neptunian love in our hearts, if that's mm-hmm. the way Pluto and Neptune are set yeah. up in the chart, in which case the ideal of Neptune is made that much more painfully taken away from us because Pluto has forced us into the mob gangster framework of a life where we cannot live by the ideal of that Neptune. Perhaps Uranus is this promise every now and then. Oh, you are there. Oh, you actually are there. And you do get glimmers of it in these sparks of Uranian experience. But Uranus, the heat of Uranus comes in and out in its way that it does. But Neptune is the ideal and Pluto is this destined blueprint for how you are going to miss it through that betrayal i hope that i I wonder how you thought about how i put that out there simon i think i think that you if if i were to talk about astrology and the outer planets through poetry Mm. i would definitely reference and use what you've described there you're very poetic and very beautiful in the way that you would synthesize and needle together the way in which those planetary archetypes work. And I, and I, I'm 100% agree with you there. Totally, totally, totally. I would say that, um, 
if I if I were to say the same thing using my own words, sure, um, it would sound like this, right? And this is where I think there's an opportunity to kind of like almost reflect and mirror back to you what it is that I mean by a why it was so poetic, mm-hmm. and b that the depth in what you've described there is is the truth in in my in my model of these outer planets. Mm-hmm. So um, to understand where I'm coming from with the outer planets, particularly. It, we need to first have this framework that it is true that the human experience has this physical world and then this unseen world. Mm. Okay. And so um, the quotes that I love to, 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 or a quote that I love to always use is from James Hillman, where he talks about the soul, not as something as a physical entity, but more as the space that exists between you and I. Okay, or you and the object. Mm-hmm. And so what it's really talking about here is, is that um, it's self-awareness of what we carry in the unconscious. Okay. Very good. Okay. All right. So we can say that there is a conscious part of us and there's an unconscious part of us. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the ego would oscillate between conscious identity. So, oh, my name is Simon. This is who I am. And then the unconscious self, which is uh, in part programming mm-hmm. from the environment which i was raised within which can be that plutonian through thread ah, I get nice. a choice, mm-hmm. right this is where i attach to this is the parents i chose this is the environment that reflects where the soul is mm-hmm. and then there is the um the part of it that has to do with how do i consciously engage in this relationship between this unconscious and this conscious self how do i make it more conscious mm-hmm. so to go back to jung's work around bringing the unconscious conscious Jung was coming through during a time when Pluto was discovered, 1931, right? And so he's got a lot of work around that and Freud and many other um, sort of, I'm going to say psychologists, but not in the context of a psychologist that you just go get, you know, psychology 101. We're talking a lot deeper here, right? Mm -hmm. Making ground ground through breakthrough and understanding these deeper realms. Yeah, metaphysically aware psychologists. Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so we would even go as far as to say it would make sense that, you know, when the scriptures were written and created with Vedic understanding, there would be this Neptunian clairvoyance, the state of consciousness that would permeate beyond, it would break the boundaries of our earthly existence, understand that we are revolving around this galaxy that even in deeper that space is far more larger, but for us to go, okay, well, all right. So we have a nebula there. Mm. I need to eat. (laughs) It's like, it's like that, that cross reference is so far apart that it doesn't actually do anything for us other than knowing that we are connected to something so infinite. It it breaks your mind to try and figure it out. Mm. But in order for me to consistently experience these things, I need to eat. Mm. So there has to be this Pisces Virgo axis. Cool. Of interrelatability. Right. Okay. So, we can say that it is true that if you go online right now, you can see that there it's pretty well absorbed in the, into the, the collective that themes or words like your unconscious or your, um, your childhood conditioning or, you know, hypnotherapy as an example, right? They access these deeper unconscious states within us. We can agree mm-hmm. to that. Mm-hmm. So we know that there's a, there's a, there's a line between, and this is, one of the best ways that I like to actually describe the relationship between the ego and this physical self and the unconscious. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is think of it this way. We've all stood at the beach and we've all looked out at the ocean. And at some point the ocean just seems to stop. Yeah. Right. It's like, we can't see further than that. Well, think of Saturn as the relationship between you and that point where the ocean stops, Mm. but we can all abstractly agree that the ocean doesn't stop at the point to which we see it. Whoa, it goes I on. Like it. Mm-hmm, that's a great so Therefore, image. in order for us to be able to access the unconscious, we need to go into metaphoric language. Yeah. We need to be symbolic. Mm. Right. And so there's two things there. A, mm. we are no longer bound by time. B, we are breaking boundaries that leads us to accessing states of storytelling and mythos as a way to translate the unconscious hence the reason why the greeks would have access to this they would know it through stories right mm-hmm. so they would tell stories 
to be able to make sense of the physical world because right. it would speak to us archetypically in that unseen world. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. So the, um, the outer planets are this, this the, the uh, consciousness expanding through telescope, Uranus, Herschel. We would have an acceleration, Uranus, right? Because when we look at a planet through a telescope, we accelerate light mm -hmm. in our perception of it, right? right. It, it allows us to see beyond our physical. Oh, so Uranus accelerates us. Cool. So in order to access Neptune and Uranus, we need to have an accelerating function. Mm. So Aquarius, Uranus accelerates things. It speeds it up. It says, we're going four times faster than what's now. So there's two things or three things that happen. One, Uranus is a trauma signature in a person's chart. Mm -hmm. A, because these are events that happen so fast that you can't process it in the moment totally. So therefore there are displaced or fragmented experience, parts of our experience mm. that are dislodged. Okay. Now I would like to ask, is it possible that there are many people who don't necessarily have a predominantly active Uranus in their chart, yes. especially early on, which means that they are not going to be dealing with the suffering of this fragmentation, but also therefore missing out on the vision of that, which is beyond the fragmentation. It's almost like you need to experience this fragmentation of Uranus in order to get the wisdom of the camera yeah. that's behind the moving frames. Right, exactly. So I would say that I think every single person on the planet experiences Uranian trauma. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that it is true that somebody whose capacity to understand the Uranian experience is different. And oh, so- cool. Right. I'm with you. So okay. let's say, let's say just for example, somebody has Uranus in the second house. Yeah. Okay. So the soul's intention in this lifetime is to accelerate Taurian themes. Mm. Okay. Mm. So in a consensus way, Uranus will always be repressed. And the reason why is because anything outside the scope of what makes us feel comfortable, we want to repress it. Mm. So governments repress COVID-19, mm. right? It, it mm -hmm. can't, it can't, like, it's like, we need to put more control in place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because we don't understand it's fear. Yeah. Right. To people that would be sitting in and seeing it as a Uranian component, it would be accelerating us to the point where people are going, you know what? I don't actually need to, to go to work physically, Tom, mm. because I've done everything online during the time that I was stuck at home. And so there's a, there's an acceleration in our consciousness that's led us to go, we've broken boundaries here, Uranus. Ah, and that acceleration came from the suffering. <laughs> exactly. And so, cool. so what we're dealing with here is that Uranus is an entry point to expanding awareness at a faster rate to which we can experience time, leading us to opening up a dimension. And depending on our capacity to understand that dimension of reality will reflect our ability to access Neptune Pluto. And think of it as Neptune, think of it as Uranus is a gateway and a protective gateway to protect people from Plutonian themes because Plutonian themes are, by the way, the Chernobyl thing happened, people died, deal with it. 9-11 happened, it, people died. That's, this is a, this is a consequence. Um, oh, Fukushima, <laughs> Fukushima, right? Yep. Same things, right? Mm -hmm. War, World War II, that happened. That's a Plutonian theme. And so that's where we deal with that kind of thing of Pluto comes in and it eliminates anything and there's no remorse. Okay, mm -hmm. so touching Plutonian experiences in ourselves, if we have the capacity to do it, is very uncomfortable for us. I'm talking like really uncomfortable for us. Like I'm talking deep emotional vulnerability. Yeah, like so, the most uncomfortable that it could be if you think Correct. about it in a certain way exactly so it's the most frozen emotional experience that we have it's mm -hmm. the most frozen it's deep deep deeply buried so if you look at the astronomy of pluto its orbit goes really 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 wide right we have mm -hmm. like what's it between i think leo it's 10 years each time up until aquarius and then yeah. it starts to go 14 15 right right so we're dealing with a planet that brings consciousness in in our solar system that takes a very long time and speaks to the most deepest core emotional frozenness or traumas that we, we have, right? Where right. we have been separated. And Neptune 
acts as a veil. Okay. So mm. Neptune acts as a veil. So in order for you to access Plutonian themes, you need to confront your own illusions. Mm. That's why when you talk about a Kundalini awakening, you need to have a special, like a special spiritual practice to be able to see your own distortions mm. because otherwise you get trapped in that whole entire space and it can act, actually lead to, to, to really damaging things. Mm. So Kundalini awakenings are a Plutonian experience. Yes, I, I completely relate right? with that. Yeah. Right. And, and so think of the outer planets as awakening to our deeper humanic nature mm. that is guarded by a threshold that only those that are prepared to liberate themselves from their own illusions of, of uh, like uh, constriction. So we have Saturn and then we have Uranus around the, the base of the Kundalini awakening, right? You need to break the shell of Saturn, your own conditioning to access the Uranian moment where you go, ah, oh, okay, I'm not a victim to this situation, mm -hmm. right? That's Once, a metaphysical, super conscious intuition that this isn't my own doing per se. It's my unconscious attracting the lessons that- Correct, uh, yeah. correct. And that's why I think it's something that's very much like, it's almost like a, it's, an, it's an elusive experience because it's necessary for those it's necessary to be elusive because those that enter it without any like sense of what they're entering into, it's a very dangerous experience. Like people can be re-traumatized by their own trauma with Uranus. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to process it correctly. Absolutely. Like I can almost think of somebody who's been in uh, a, a cave for like 25 years, throw somebody like that into a, a bar where they're trying to interact socially and trying to connect with people and it can almost be traumatic because even yes. just going up and talking to a person is this most sensitive thing. Yes. Uh, and I relate that in a way to that, um, the, the outer planet experience is that it's so new, but yet it's so intrinsic to what we are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Very one thing I just want to say just before I, because I just want to kind of tie it up is that sure. one of the beautiful things about the, the outer planets is if you look at it through this lens, Uranus transformation. So the form is still the same, but it transforms into something different. So Uranus going down. Mm. So the moments of consciousness going from Saturn to Uranus mm. is Uranus awakens us. It accelerates it like this, like wake up shock. Right. And then that transformation leads to Neptune, which is transcendence. Mm. So it's to, to transcend the ego's attachment to the experiences. This is personally happening to me but to see the deeper meaning in the experience, Neptune, right? To take right. us even deeper into Pluto because we can't even get to Pluto unless we have the capacity for that depth, Neptune. Mm. So transcendence. And then when we hit Pluto, something must die. That's why it's the dark night of the soul, the ego death. The it actual must be transmuted, death mm. right? Mm. So transformation, transcendence, transmutation. Now, what happens when somebody transmutes something? Pluto invites us to experience divine love because once we've come to the point of absolutely no return and we, we are forced to surrender our ego structure and to transform, or in this case, to transmute, we come back from that experience, like the hero's journey, right? So we hit that point of that hero's journey. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, yep. but I can share a little bit about it. Right. So yep. that Joseph we Campbell. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Once we transmute that, then what happens is when we come back up, we bring empowerment with us, Pluto, and it goes through Neptune and we have meaning, authentic meaning, not a self-appointed, I am the guru, right. but an actual authentic sense of, I know what I'm talking about because I've, I've seen hell. I've experienced it and there's no yes. need for anybody to try and convince or say anything outside of the hellish experience that I've had. Yes. So when you get to Neptune, you reinstate meaning in a way that is pure because there's no ego, there's no ego in it because that state of, of complete compassion and empathy for seeing somebody that, so somebody loses a child and they start a center for those parents who have lost children to deal with their grief, mm. right? It's pure because there's a sense of deep knowing that that grief fractured them. So when they see other people processing their grief, they hope they create a center for every Monday and, and Wednesday parents come there and they talk about this, they process through their grief, right? Yeah, that would be the Neptunian experience. And then the Uranian point comes back up and it in, you individuate. 
So you, Uranus speaks to in a person's chart where your deepest sense of um, liberation comes from, mm -hmm. but it also speaks to where in your chart you will find your deepest sense of purpose. Wow. Because it's the part of you that is individuated. It's like, here you are unique. Here is your individual journey. It's the thread that goes into the unconscious that makes you individual. So who are you in this collective unconscious? It's very interesting. I almost see that there's an entry point going up to Pluto and then there's an exit point coming from Pluto yes. uh, with regards to Uranus. So yes. I'm assuming it's very possible that if somebody's had some kind of traumatic experience while they were younger, if that mm -hmm. is the, the symbol of their initiation into the metaphysics of Uranus while they were younger, they have a Plutonian experience at some point, ideally. And then once they're coming from Pluto back to Earth, Uranus is going to be one of the most powerful swords they have to wield the nature of trauma and to isolate the traumatic nature of Pluto by being by accepting Uranian trauma as part of the fact An of evolutionary life. pattern of growth. Right. You got it. Right. That is right. exactly it. Now, what I'm interested in right now, Simon, um, is I'm part, okay, so my brain is telling me uh, in the Vedic sense, usually we always have an auspicious unfoldment of the energy. And then there is what we would call the, a less auspicious unfoldment of potential energy. Sure. Um, is it possible that, you know, somebody can have an auspicious play out of these energies if they have the right karma for it, where mm -hmm. again, they, everybody has these Uranian fragmenting yes. experiences. Everybody has the Neptunian connection and disconnection from the divine mother of true meaning. And then everybody has a neurogenetic wave of karma that is their pedestal for playing yeah. on this meaning. Uh, uh -huh. It's the form, the vessel. Now, yeah. going to Pluto and then coming out of Pluto, you go from the transmutation. Yeah. I transmutation ideally means that you're you've dissolved enough of the excess of shell husk of the ego that there's nothing holding that Plutonian transformative yes. catalysis. Yeah. Uh, but there is still a form on Earth. As you've said, because you mentioned Pluto and its highest form is a transmutation, mm -hmm. which means we're not throwing away the baby with the bathwater. No. That's an old phrase in India. When you're facing transformation, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, you, yeah. you don't want to throw away the soul karma. So we go from the Pluto experience of transmutation. We learn how to be in reality with the intense all time zeroed yeah. into one space in the heart. Then mm -hmm. we have the Neptune experience, which is we find a meaning, an individuated meaning yes. from the deepest transmutation. Yes. And then the Uran we wield Uranus like a sword, being willing to deal with those in reality who have not had the same ecstatic mystic That's trip right. that we have. Exactly. Now, I imagine it must be possible, and it's probably the case, that most people are not going to follow this auspicious pattern of transmutation. Mm -hmm. And this I'm, I'm trying to now wield, you know, we've talked about the archetypes kind of in their essence. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to unfold for those of us now who as astrologers, sure. why can this go wrong? And why, you know, what does it mean for the soul? Sure. For example, you know, if somebody has a Kundalini experience very early on in their lives, uh, again, Carl Jung talked about this. Uh, he was more referring to a Neptunian experience. Yes, he was. Where he had a, a big period of his life where he says uh, in it's one of the books of his that I've read, it's actually a, a Stephen Arroyo book, Karma, okay. Tr Astrology, Transformation. He quotes Jung and he tells this whole story where Carl Jung was having an, a deep, intense Neptunian transit experience. And what he said was, if I didn't have my wife, if I didn't have my regular job, if I didn't wake up on a schedule, I would have dissolved into the fifth dimension or something like that because he had this earth-grounded yes. responsibilities 
that allowed him to exist and to keep his biological processes going while he <laughs> transmuted or, uh, you know, ne the Neptunian word permeated uh -huh. his experience with what he was feeling as the divine mother of that, of the meaning of the meaning. Uh, he wanted to let all these, the spider web of physical stuff that he was holding on to, he wanted to let it go and just open up to this heartfelt thing. But because he held on to his earth experience, he had life and a backbone and a wife and a family and all these things to inject with yes. Neptunian meaning. And they held and reflected it so that it wasn't just lost in, you know, a mid forties midlife bender that's many people have in, in, uh -huh. in certain times. So for young at this point, he intuited properly that this was an experience that had some kind of proper organic play out so that the Neptunian experience wouldn't dissolve his ego so much sure. that he lost all the things that actually had earthly meaning to him. Mm, mm, mm. Now, with this being the case, do you find as an astrologer, when you are doing charts for people, do you find disjointed applications of this prefer of this ideal unfoldment of these outer planets when you're working with people? 100%. And I think that one of the major reasons why that's the case is A, um, when we go to school, uh, our primary form of education is rooted in things that don't tell us about the the mystical and the divine mm. and so we don't even we don't even train ourselves to to make sense of those things we shut them down and so you know there's there's a, a big part in the western culture at least that's that doesn't necessarily pro like like uh, promote this mm -hmm. this of course is changing because mm -hmm. of neptune through pisces at the moment right um <laughs> so yeah exactly right and then of course uranus is transferred in aries um accelerated our relationship to the structures and recognize that institutions are outdated and med medieval mm -hmm. and so we need to find better ways to uh structure our reality according to neptune's dissolving of a way of how we felt institutions served humanity and its desire for deeper awareness mm -hmm. Does that make sense yes yeah, certainly so, we're dealing with the trauma right now of a massively displaced culture worldwide uh, in the sense that, okay, what do we do without structures anymore? Mm. You know, <laughs> Simon, I have, I understand what you're saying. Uh, it's making me think, you know, there's a lot of debate in the world about what exactly the age of astrology means. A sure. lot of people pin it to the ecliptic um, sure. in the sense that the progression of the equinox has caused us Mm -hmm. So that we are pointed at the Milky Way galaxy, uh, aimed at Aquarius, I believe. Sure. I'm not sure the astronomy is better as much as I could have it. But would you say that there is some reflection of this consciousness of the age of Aquarius reflecting on Uranus as being the first gate out of Saturn? Yes. Yes. 100%. And, and Absolutely. so it's bound to be the case that these days... Uh, there's painful glimmers of metaphysical in inception on the minds of everybody that a lot of the teaching, you know, how many elementary grade school teachers are there who are aware of what you and I are talking about yeah. and are kicking themselves for not teaching the kids. You know, there's probably ones that are just like teaching uh -huh. the regular math and stuff and be like, by the way, kids, the number one relates with Mars and Aries, <laughs> you know, and secretly seeding it in there. Um, so I, that was my point there is that there must be a, a gateway opening in the age of Aquarius to Uranus again, as the arbiter of that, which is beyond Saturn and material experience. Yes. 100%. That is exactly the way it will work. And it is how it works and think of it more as bands of, of consciousness or, or bands of, of, um, uh, prince archetypal principles. Mm -hmm. And so if we, if we navigate a certain part of the river that has a very Piscean tone to it, then it's natural that the way to which we will um, reflect that Piscean tone, because we will mm -hmm. almost in a sense kind of um, integrate the Piscean reflection in us, but we will also be 
conduits for that expression. So think mm. of the nature of reality permeating through us in a Piscean way. So we would have religion, organized religion as a way of, you know, Christ consciousness as a way of understanding reality. But mm. Aquarius has nothing to do with that. Aquarius is the point to which we have integrated that Christ consciousness into a singularity. Mm. So that's why singularity is such a cool word right now, because we're tapping into that state in which we're recognizing a that all forms, we, we're coming to the close of that age, as it were, and we're like, oh, okay, we found the God particle, right? Mm, mm-hmm. That's a natural desire within us to find the source. But now- In this Piscean age we're talking yes, about, 2,000 precisely. years ago and up to now. Precisely, exactly. And so now our consciousness moves through the band or the part of the river where Aquarius themes take place. And Aquarius is very, very different to Pisces. In Pisces, it's very kumbaya. Everybody sits around a campfire. We share a humanist story. Aquarius is, this is my story. What's your story? Very individuated. We don't share the same experience. My perception of reality is different to that. And Mm. that's why you'll see this really interesting Frankenstein crossover between worlds where society is interfacing with technology Mm. and technology is reflective of a more of Aquarius age band, but Mm. we're interfacing it with our conditioning that is still rooted in Piscean principles. So um, people initially go into Facebook to create a connection to those that they know from the past and memories, whereas Mm -hmm. that technology is, it's not actually about that. It's, It's an acceleration in a way where it's not only been with us for 20 years, we don't know what to do with it, but that's, mm. that's a cool conversation to have in a different way. Totally. But, um, totally. I'm very intrigued to, by that. To come back to your point around um, bands and, and Jung and mm-hmm. stuff, it will become more and more real that as, as Aquarius, as our genetics and our genome evolves through the band that is the Aquarius, that we will see these bands of, or these, these lengths of, of our life in uh, in a pattern that is more conscious. So we would say, okay, at the Saturn return point, we now reach a point of coming back to the womb and doing X, Y, Z. And then at the age of 38, we would have a Neptune square that would dissolve certain preconditions of our society, of our upbringing that is meant to freshen our awareness so that when we go through Uranus supposition between the ages of four, four, like 39 and 43, yeah. our consciousness is fresh to be spiritually reborn so that we can actually understand the purpose of our individuality as opposed to our conditioned idea of what we should have become. So just to kind of break that down, what are you going to be Johnny when you're, you know, at the age of nine, like, what do you want to be a firefighter? Right. And Johnny's soul is like, why would I want to be a firefighter? But that's what I'm being impregnated with. Ah, That's what it is. Mm -hmm. But when you hit your ass opposition, you've had so much experience that you're like, why do I want to be like, I don't want to have these social constraints. Right. So, yeah, you get your, your Chiron return at the age of 51. That's a different phase. Mm-hmm. It's deeper integration of the spiritual awareness, right? Mm-hmm. So I think these, these states will become more and more understood. But As time goes on. At, and- exactly. Mm-hmm. But we're at the threshold. And so that's why we'll have radicals in mm-hmm. the sense of me and you speaking about these things. But if we went into a kind of consensus world and started talking about concepts like this, it would really threaten people's sense of safety and security because we're bringing multi-dimensional reality uranus to a very saturnian state which is no the table's there and that's the only thing that exists yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. what is a table mm. is it is, is a table only exclusive to four che- four legs or All can right. a table be something that's you know a stump of wood that you put a plate on, like, how do we define these things, right? It's yeah. too uncomfortable to go into that complexity because the resolution of reality for those, they can't access that. So yeah, th- this is the crossover that I mean here. Yeah, because there's a survival instinct that comes from us having programmed words for programmed things. You exactly. know, when I think of, you know, it's good for me to know what mother is in order uh-huh. for me to know something that kind of nurtures me. And if you use a different word for it, then it's hard to grasp what it is that's good for me what it is that's spiritual you know in the spiritual world people talk about fasting and things like letting go of the material survival instincts that have kept Mm. us Mm. surviving for so long uh so there has to be this like annoying and frustrating jump 
uh, yes. in this Uranian way that things are going about. That's exactly. And that's why Uranus can be a trolling signature because people don't see that accelerated experience as, as an awakening, like a lightning shock, like, hey, wake up, you're in your present moment. Mm-hmm. The nervous system can't contain or handle the complexity of it. And so therefore we, we repress it, right? We put it into the unconscious and then it, it, it acts out in our later lives as displaced emotions or irrational behavior, or anxiety, mm-hmm. et cetera. Like that would be a practical example. So when people yeah. are struggling with anxiety and stuff, the question you want to look at is where is Uranus in your chart and what's it aspecting? Mm-hmm. And at some point you'll go through one, two, let's say Uranus is sitting here. You'll go one, two, three, four. There'll be four points, four times in a month where the moon will aspect your natal Uranus. Oh, cool. Where you'll have a subtlety of, of anxiety show up. And that's just literally because the moon, the most sensitive part, is illuminating something that's in the unconscious mm-hmm. that's fragmented or a little bit kind of like scary for you. Mm. And so we feel that that little bit of unhingedness of whatever, and that will show us what's beneath the surface. Very now, interesting. For like me, I'm like, oh, let's go there. Yeah, right? of I course. Flash yeah. Out of the map. <laughs> Very interesting, Simon. Now I'm wondering, uh, in your professional astrology practice, do you oh. often, you know, I, I'm learning. I'm I've been doing charts uh, all year because my school, sure. I'm done school now. And my teacher just said, sink or swim, go out and do charts. <laughs> uh, and I was like, ah, it's, yeah, you know, it's a hard thing to get used to. So, uh, in my experience of doing charts, uh, I often find that I, you know, there's the astrology chart and I'm coming to find that the astrology chart has potentials, but you really yeah. have to knock on the person and say, what state of awakening are you at in terms of the potentials that you've been given? Yes. And a lot of the times it's difficult to discern that from the chart itself. What you have to do is actually right. talk to the person and say, okay, so this is why I'm wondering in your sense, where if you were to speak to somebody in terms of them unlocking and opening up these very, very subtle psychocerebral energy centers of the outer planets, you probably don't want to just run out of the gate and say, okay, you're having a Uranus experience and you're going to deal with it. Well, what you probably do, if I'm correct in what you're saying, do you ever back cycle and ask a person? Okay. So are you anxious? Oh, you're feeling anxiousness. Okay. Well, you know, are you close to your Saturn return? No. Are you close to Saturn transiting the moon? No. Okay. Let me look at when was the last time your moon squared Uranus? It was this date. How did you feel at that time? You asked the person the few, last time moon was in the square and then last time it was conjunct. Last time it was at the other square. Last time it was opposite Uranus. You asked them, this was this date. This was this date. This was this date. How did you feel? How did you feel? And if they respond with every moment that you're, every day that you're mentioning has been a complete traumatic shakeup for me, is this a barometer for the person's development in the Uranian sphere? Okay. So one of the things that I want to steal, by the way, and, yeah. um, I'll credit you for it, but you said something, I love words, Northern and Gemini, and you said psychocerebral experience of the outer planets. And yeah. when I heard you say that, I was like, that is probably one of the coolest ways I've ever heard a way in you could relate metaphysical reality to the physical because it is literally that, right? There's this right. cerebral attachment to this thing. So I just want to comment on oh, that. Oh, well, bless. That's freaking Thank cool. Um, okay. So, so yes, you're right. And I think the model of reality that I come from when interfacing with somebody is thinking about the capacity that the ego has to digest what is beyond their most immediate reality right mm-hmm. so when you're talking about the outer planets you are really bringing something from the unconscious to the surface mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. right and so uh do they have the capacity to process that mm-hmm. now in almost all cases the answer is no mm-hmm. okay in mm-hmm. almost all cases the answer is no got it until you set the intention for that to be the case why? Because think of it like this. In EA, they use the model of the ocean and the wave analogy. Mm-hmm. So it's like Pluto, think of the ocean as consciousness and Neptune. Yeah. So, right? 
nobody's coming to save you when you're on the ocean. Mm -hmm. Pluto is a representation of kinetic energy that is rising out of the ocean and, and there's a wave. So it rises out, right? So Pluto is a representation of something that's rising, coming mm. from the deep unconscious, rising into your life. Yeah, certainly. And then the tip of the, the wave would be the, the self, the ego, right? The form, the nodes of the moon and, and the ego self. And so mm. you have this beautiful relationship between the self and the deeper experience that is emerging from the source. So in a, in a more biological say, you could say, what's arising from your instincts that are connected to your genetic material? Yeah, the neurogenetic, yeah. Right, okay. So if you set the intention to say, hey, today, this is a conversation, I can talk about some things that are gonna be a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. If you feel that you are at a place within yourself that you could open up some things that are more uncomfortable. They're not uncomfortable because they are uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable because the biology of your brain needs it to be uncomfortable because if it wasn't you'd be standing over a flame with your hand over it going this is not hurting me and what right? be the point yes so so we have to kind of break that barrier of the brain's autonomic response to things that are uncomfortable is to avoid them mm. it's just an evolutionary pattern and it's part of our more primal ways of dealing with things wow very interesting because that's yeah. how we always deal on earth is going towards that which feels good mom is titty yeah you know, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Whatever feels good when you're dealing with Pluto, you've got to reset the most basic of basics, which is good. Yes. Is good. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. I'm with you. So, so exploring this over here, um, the pattern recognition and the investigative role is by far probably one of the most fascinating things that you can use astrology chart for, because that's what it is. It's a map mm. and the terrain is different. So, okay, cool. So I see that you've got Uranus sitting in your 10th house and the moon squared it in the seventh. So my sense of it is that you probably had a very sudden change in expectation around a certain agreement that you had with somebody. And that must've been really upsetting for you, right? Mm -hmm. so the person say, yes, yes, that was the case. Okay, so, so it seems that, and then you kind of lead with how their experience of that has manifesting for them. So you can something along the lines of, would you like to go further? Mm. I say, yes, yes, okay, explore it, okay. So do you know where this comes from? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I can let you know. Okay. Yes. All right. So let's, let's explore mom and dad for a bit. Right. Uranus in the 10th house is always going to be around mom and dad. Right. So mm -hmm. they're going to say, okay, okay, I got this. And you can really start to feel, oh shit, mom was very oppressive. She didn't like to, to X, Y, Z, Uranus in the 10th trauma around repression. Right. Right. Trauma His around dad. becoming the self that you're supposed to be. Exactly. Facing exactly. That. Yeah. Exactly. So then you would say, okay, dad probably was a little bit detached. Mm. Yes. Okay. These things are, are a, a, a mechanical expression of those symbols together, mm. but they are not the intention. You having an oppressive parent is not done there for you because you're a bad person. Mm. It's meant for you to understand that there's something rebellious in you that's trying to emerge. Mm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. in, that's why Saturn and Uranus are, they, they must work together because in order for rebellion to take place, something must be oppressing it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So think of it like this. If you, if you speak to somebody with Uranus in the 10th house, the question, I hope this is kind of valuable. The mm -hmm. question becomes this along the lines of like, okay, at some point, the structure in your life had meaning. It was working for you. But at some point within the soul's journey, that structure became outdated. You're honest. Mm -hmm. It accelerated it, right? right? So the soul carries this memory of, you know, I don't want to be part of this institution anymore. I don't feel like it's bringing me the structure to experience my consciousness. So the soul will create a life where the same memory will be there, but it will be a parent that will reflect the institution. Mm -hmm. And the rebellion in you is to try and find why it is that you're trying to like, what is it about this rebelling against the structure that is trying to, and this is the key word, remember the soul meaning. So when we think about the ego and we think about the unconscious, it's a remembrance experience. We are remembering the, the soul to the ego and that's the spiritual experience. So that's what Neptune does, right? In order to dissolve the ego is to merge with the unconscious and then you come out and say, ah, okay, my rebellion towards the parent is not about me being a bad person, but it's actually about an instinctive need to understand that institutions or structures 
or something that is not part of this lifetime and I've got to figure out a new way of doing it. Maybe no. I've got to become my own boss. And there's a so karmic alteration edge. that happened that made me stick from, yes. uh, it stuck me from perceiving the true transcendence of the Neptunian experience. Yes, yes. And so there's that transformation. And so the moon would reflect, say, moving through the seventh house as, a, as an, un, like an expectation that wasn't met. It jolts you into realizing, hey, by the way, we've got to be paying attention to that Geronian purpose, that individuated process, because we can forget about it. Right, right. right. So that's what these experiences do. And so that's how you can really open up a truly transformative experience for somebody. But at the same time, very important, there's no reason to actually talk about the whole chart because it's mm. too much. Yeah, I'm learning that. I'm learning that right? in my own practice. I appreciate so you saying that. What's real for you right now? Wonderful. Relationships. Relationships are real for me. Okay, cool. Let's talk about relationships in your chart. Ah, oh, because no matter what is in the full chart, you'll be able to see it's like a photon of light contains all light. And in the same way, you hit a person right with what's real for their experience right now and you will find a doorway to whatever mm -hmm. is in the chart that they need mm -hmm. to ex channel through the experience they're presently having that's right that's right that is incredibly useful simon now i think that we're at a place where we're just starting to run out of time my friend mm -hmm. um this has been incredibly informative and i should say i really appreciate the more astrologers i talk to uh especially in the youtube world I'm pleased to find that I am often pulled out of the mechanical dimensions of astrology and am put into a dynamic heart space, let's yes. say, between myself as the astrologer and the client, where mm -hmm. astrology becomes a useful tool or filter yes. for getting in touch with the client, but it is not in itself the client. It's not yeah. in itself the vessel. It is a way for me to reach into their experience, but my heart has to lead into their heart and ask these difficult questions. Then I can use astrology to see the tread marks that I've come yes. to in my yes. heartfelt interaction. Yes. Yes. Simon, this has been incredibly insightful to me. Now, cool. to be honest with you, I feel like I could chat with you forever about this stuff. <laughs> but uh, as you and I were saying, uh, I would love to have you on my channel more. Uh, so let's stay in touch because Absolutely. I feel my vibrations have been raised. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> so thank like you it. so much, my friend, for coming on to my show and taking time to talk to all of us on my channel, How to Rock Astrology. Yeah. Now, Simon, for all those who have been watching, uh, you can find Simon at his website, raising-vibrations.com. You can also find Simon and his partner, Jen, uh, on that website, as well as on your YouTube channel. Yeah. Simon, is there anything else that you'd like to throw at us before we end our session today? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. Like, I just do a uh, new and full moon uh, uh reports and mm -hmm. i just talk about astrology in this way and and yeah that's it that's the two places you can find me mm -hmm. i noticed that you're doing something along the lines of a you can people can call you because you're currently involved in something where you're taking people again going beyond astrology and just on your website you have a thing that says give me a call if you have some kind of important metaphysical contribution to make to the world because we know that the iranian space is unfolding and you've encouraged people to give you that call. Uh, yes. So I wanted to throw that out here as well. For anybody interested, if you're curious what I'm talking about, uh, check out raising-vibrations.com. And Simon will be there to give you a little bit more on this particular call. Absolutely. Okay. Sweet. Well, thank All you, right. Simon. Uh, let's, uh, let's call her a day for now. I'm going to stop recording and then I'll just say one last goodbye to you. For everybody watching, thanks so much for being a part of this, and hopefully you'll see Simon again on my channel soon. Take care, folks.